Picking out the perfect PC components can be a tricky choice at the best of times. But with well-documented advice on how to find the perfect GPU, which CPU is best or heck, even how much RAM a gaming PC needs, at least for most components you can easily figure it out. With motherboards though, that's not always the case. With so many different manufacturers, models, chipsets, and a plethora of new designs launching every year, in the last year we've had probably 50 or 60 new motherboards hit the market, the choice just gets more and more confusing. So in this video, I'm going to show you how to pick the perfect motherboard for your gaming PC in 2023 and show you that you don't necessarily have to spend a fortune to get the features you're after, even in slightly higher end builds. Let's dive into it. Let's start off with a little bit of important context and answer the big question first. What exactly is a motherboard? And the answer is not quite as simple as you might think. A motherboard in a gaming PC context is basically the skeleton that holds the whole build together. Not only does it provide the physical slots where you install the graphics card, memory, and your processor, but it also also provides power to lots of those parts. You also might find your graphics card has additional power connectors on it to provide even more, but the motherboard provides a base amount, while also giving you all the connectivity, both in terms of your external I.O., so your USB ports, your HDMI outputs, Ethernet cables, but also any of your internal I.O. as well. So the USB headers that you plug up your fan controller or RGB hubs to, or the USB 3.1 Gen 2 header that the front panel on your case also connects into. For this reason, picking the motherboard with the right connectivity and functions is important. But one thing about modern motherboards is they're all resoundingly very similar. Available in three or four mainstream form factors, from mini ITX to micro ATX, ATX and EATX, smallest to largest, you'll find a range of different designs with different features and connectivity. On the whole, micro ATX and ATX boards tend to be the cheapest as they have the most conventional form factors, while extended ATX boards, EATX designs, cost more due to the added space which is created to pack in more features and more connectivity. Mini ITX boards are the smallest and are perfectly designed for small form factor systems. For most people watching this video, an ATX board is gonna be the best suited option for you, but micro ATX designs can also be popular as their smaller form factor can mean cost savings. Though with modern boards, that tends to be less of the case. But how do you determine what level of features is available on the motherboard you want to choose, other than looking at the price, which can be a volatile variable and often a bit unreliable, but more on that later. Well, first off, you need to pick whether you're going for an AMD design or an Intel design. The boards on my left or your right support AMD processors, specifically Ryzen 7000, while the boards to my other side support Intel processors, namely 12th and 13th gen, all the way from the i3s right through to the i9 and everything in between. CPU manufacturers like Intel and AMD actually license what we call a chipset to the motherboard maker. The chipset determines the level of connectivity and features available on a motherboard and the CPU support you can expect. Intel's way of naming it has always been to give the high-end chipsets a Z letter at the start, like this Prime Z790 motherboard, and their lower-end chipsets a B letter. So you've got here a B760. You'll see if you look through older motherboards, you'll find a Z690, a Z590, 490, 390, 290, what you get, the point that keeps going, and you'll see the same with the B lineup. Intel boards are also available in a H-series chipset designation, though we haven't seen any H-series motherboards released for some time. And for most people, spending anywhere up from about $800 on a gaming PC, H-series isn't really worth the box it's written on, in my opinion. Z-series motherboards on Intel's side have the highest level of features and support both CPU and memory overclocking, while B-series chipsets support memory overclocking only, and no CPU overclocking. AMD is a bit different, a bit more consumer-friendly in the sense that both their high and low-end chips chipset tiers support overclocking for CPU and RAM, but with AMD you'll find X series and then the B series. So X670 is the high-end chipset, while B650 is the low-end chipset. To make matters a little bit more complicated, there's a new thing out called PCI Gen 5. You might have heard of it. No modern graphics cards or SSDs currently leverage the standard, but we'd expect RTX 5000 and AMD's RX 8000 series to do so. And on AMD, if the chipset has an E at the end, standing for extreme, it supports PCI Gen 5, while those boards without do not. On the Intel side, it varies on a board by board basis. Most Z790s support it, and most B760s actually also give you at least a degree of PCI Gen 5. On the Intel side as well, some modern motherboards support DDR4 or DDR5 memory. You only get one, so make sure to check, whereas AMD is DDR5 only. Now, there's two major design philosophies at play here with Intel and AMD that are really worth bearing in mind. Intel tend to change the socket on the motherboard that is required for their CPUs every two generations. So 
12th and 13th gen used the same socket, so did 10th and 11th, so did 8th and 9th, etc, etc. What that means is that the same socket is supported for about three, three and a half years. AMD, on the other hand, support the same socket for more like five, six, or even seven years, which is very impressive. What that means is if you're buying an AMD motherboard, it might be worth factoring in a little bit more the features that are involved that you might want to leverage later on for future proofing than with Intel. As with a Z790 board, it won't support any new future Intel CPUs, and to buy one of those will require a new motherboard anyway, so there's not much point looking at future proofing too heavily. In terms of the manufacturers out there to choose from, there's a few major ones. Asus, MSI and Gigabyte are the largest and come to mind first, but you'll also find motherboard designs from ASRock, Biostar and more recently NZXT who make some really compelling designs that are based around some of the ASRock options in terms of under the skin, under the design. It's ASRock who have done a lot of the design work in terms of the BIOS and some of the connectivity on those boards. So let's build it up shall we? Let's start off with the budget gamer and the motherboard features you'll be looking for at that end and work up getting a bit more expensive as we go. For the budget gamer on Intel and AMD, you want the B series of chipsets. AMD gets overclocking for both, whereas Intel limits it to the RAM only. But that's not necessarily a terrible thing, as in a budget build, the cooling might not be capable of providing much of an overclock anyway. PCI Gen 5 isn't a feature you'll need to worry about for SSDs or graphics cards, and PCI Gen 4 is going to provide more than enough bandwidth for any part you'll be using. Make sure you pick up a board with at least four RAM DIMM slots, as I find four RAM DIMMs just is a bit of a better option. RAM is an easy component to upgrade later, and if you've got spare DIMMs, you can just add more in. As long as it's an identical kit to what you've already got, you'll be fine. The last thing you want to do is throw a whole RAM kit away because you need larger DIMMs and you've populated all of your slots. I'd also ensure you've got plenty of connectivity. You've got to be realistic on the budget end. 10 gig internet isn't going to happen, but USB-C certainly is feasible. And check the I.O. that's included on your case can be powered by the motherboard you've picked. For example, if your case has a USB-C, make sure your motherboard has a USB-C header. Otherwise, there's not really too much to consider at the budget end, and to be honest, most motherboards are going to satisfy more than enough of the features you're after. Additional quality of life features like Asus's button that releases the graphics card rather than the fiddly clip is a nice to have, and you'll also want to make sure that the design, especially on the lower end, has plenty of SATA ports and M.2 SSD slots to suit your storage requirements. If you're moving over four hard drives from an old build, first you should probably stop hoarding, but second you should make sure there's plenty of those connectors available. Lower end chipsets have less bandwidth and that's always going to mean less features, so be realistic. A cheap $150 motherboard is never going to facilitate 7 SSDs and 4 SATA hard drives. There's simply not the throughput there on the CPU and the chipset. On the AMD side of the equation, you also need to be realistic when it comes to the prospect of overclocking. While supported on B-series designs, you aren't going to get the mileage you'd achieve on higher end options. But at the budget end, I wouldn't recommend stepping up to the higher end chipsets as the money is better spent if available on a higher end CPU. A better CPU is always going to provide more performance than overclocking. At the mid-range, a standard ATX design is going to work fine, and you'll be able to pick between either the lower-end Z or X chipset options, so the cheaper $250, $300 boards, and the higher-end B760 or B650 options available. I'd always try and keep in mind that the higher-end chipset will give you more features. It's better to get, normally, a low-end high chipset board than it is a high-end low chipset board, as you're always going to be constrained by the chipset. And keep more of a finger on the pulse in terms of overclocking as having that capability will afford you more free performance at that mid-range level. Also keep an eye out as some boards at the same prices will include Wi-Fi 6E and some won't. Some will include fast 2.5 or 10 gigabit Ethernet, some won't. Some will include loads of the latest USB generation ports, some won't. Some will include optical audio outputs if that's useful for you for plugging up to high-end speakers, some won't. And some will include PCI Gen 5, you guess what I'm about to say, some won't. And that is a particular feature that on the mid-range will help you future-proof. I don't think it's hugely necessary and should be of a huge concern, but if the two boards are the same price, you might as well have the one with Gen 5 versus the one without. At the high end, it's kind of anyone's game. The high end motherboards are very, very expensive. And in order to justify these, you're going to want to buy an i9 or a Ryzen 9. The Ryzen 7 or i7 are just not justified on five, six, or even $700 motherboards. If you're looking at a really high-end board, consider whether you need it, as the mid-range options won't bottleneck the CPU, will still give you a decent degree of overclocking, and will cost you a lot less money. High-end boards are going to give features like 10 gigabit Ethernet or even dual 10 gig ports with loads and loads of NVMe slots. They might also provide top-tier overclocking if that's something you're really keen on having in your system. 
system. We'll link some of our favorite boards that meet these criteria below, but the summary, the TLDR, is that you probably don't need to spend as much on your motherboard as you think, and keeping too much of an eye on future proofing is a bad idea. Make sure you get a board with at least four RAM DIMM slots and PCI Generation 5, and be mindful of the different color scheme options available. Lines like the Strix lineup from Asus look fantastic, but will always cost you more than some of their other derivatives or even competition from companies like MSI, and compare the feature set, but start off by looking at the motherboard form factor first, CPU compatibility, and then the features you need. You can find our favorite motherboards linked down below. If you enjoyed this one, get subscribed. Thanks for watching. And as always, we'll see you in the next one.